I am Thomas, and we are in Hamilton uh, Township, which is in Mercer County, uh, New Jersey. And we're going to be visiting uh, Megan's place. It's a memorial park uh, in honor of Megan Kanka. Now, the park, by the way, uh, it's located on 27 Barbara Lee Drive, 27 Bar Barbara Lee Drive. It's in the middle of a residential neighborhood. There you see Megan Kanka. Uh, you might be very familiar with this story. She was just seven years old when she passed away. She died in the house that was formerly located on 27 Barbara Lee Drive, which is now the home or the place of Megan's Memorial Park, which we will show you. Megan's Place is the actual name of the park. That whole, that house, rightfully so, was demolished that was on Barbara Lee Drive, where the park is located. And that house belonged to the individual that murdered Megan Kanka. Megan Kanka lived on the same block of the person who killed her, which was Jesse Timidakis, if I'm pronouncing the name right. Story, we'll backtrack it. It goes back to 1994 and he lured Megan into his house uh, where he he killed her strangled her with a belt he raped her he then disposed of her body in nearby Mercer County Park the next day he confessed to investigators and led police to the site. There is the uh, the newspaper uh, article that you know made the rounds. This is a pretty well known story. There was tons of evidence. It included blood stains, hair, fiber samples, as well as bite marks uh, that matched Kanka's teeth. On this monster's hand. And it led to a guilty verdict. On charges of kidnapping. It was four counts of aggravated sexual assault. And two counts of felony murder. Now. Jesse was originally sentenced to death that deserves a round of applause I say and that was upheld by a New Jersey Supreme Court on appeal and this individual this monster he remained on death row in New Jersey until 2007 when the legislature, the New Jersey legislature, at that point, they had abolished capital punishment. As a result, uh, his life sentence, no, well, his, his sentence was commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. This is that monster located on the right, in Jesse. What goes through people's minds to do such despicable acts? I will... And I don't think no one, not any one of us, will ever understand. So before all of this happened, before the death of Megan happened, um, 
you know, Jesse over here had two previous convictions for sexually assaulting girls. He was, in 1979, he pleaded guilty to attempted aggravated sexual assault of a five-year-old. He was given a suspended sentence, and after failing to attend counseling, he was sent for nine months to a correctional facility. Then, in 1981, he pleaded guilty to an assault of a seven-year-old. And he was in, uh, imprisoned in a treatment center for six years. They, they, the, the acronym that they use is a ADTC, and this is the street where Megan lived. Uh, we will go to the park momentarily. Not sure what an ADT exactly stands for, uh, but he participated a little, apparently, in the treatment program that was offered in the ATC. Megan's death led to the New Jersey General Assembly. He passed a series of bills that required a sex offender registry with a database tracked by the state, community notification of registered sex offenders moving into a neighborhood and then life in prison for second-time offenders. The, the governor, the assemblyman at the time, Paul Kramer, he expressed, as he created, as this bill was created, that Megan Kanka would be alive today if the bills he proposed had been law. Megan Kanka's death led to the passing of Megan's Law. This is the memorial park for Megan Kanka. The house that she died in through the hands of this monster stood here and no longer stands here. Just the park in Megan's memory. Actually in the middle of a residential you know, street. So her death again led to Megan's Law. Every sexual offender must register. There was also the Megan Nicole Kanka Foundation, which was founded. And that's a nonprofit uh, charity that was founded by the family of Mega Kanka with the intent of preventing crimes against children. You know, as I drove through this neighborhood, this is a very nice neighborhood. Very peaceful. There you see Megan's Law being, you know, uh, passing and being signed off by then President uh, Bill Clinton. It's a very peaceful neighborhood. Far, far away from, you know, the, well, about an hour and a half away from New York City. Suburbia. You know, white picket fences, you know, driving through that area. You know, people would wave as you're passing them by, you know, like a courtesy wave. A hello with a big smile. Stuff like that, let me tell you. Stuff like that does not happen in, in New York, the metropolitan area where I'm from. Uh, there is the uh, rest of the neighborhood. And even based on that, you never know who's living in your neighborhood. You never know. You never knew. Just smiling, and he never knew what type of 
closets or what's, you know, what that person is hiding. Very scary world. You, you think, you know, it, it, it begs the question, even back then, and even now, is there any place that's truly safe? Megan's Law definitely helps make the world make, you know, helps make the world a, a little bit safer. But it still just makes you absolutely be afraid to leave your house. And I know that's not the way to live. Rest in peace to Megan as I give you one last look here of the Memorial Park. And you just think now how many lives Megan's Law has saved and how many lives Megan's Foundation has saved. And I think the answer would be a lot as prevented, I think, or deterred a lot of crimes.